privilege to uh, Matt and Meg. Today, actually, for me, is uh, one of the most exciting days in our year when we uh, commissioned volunteers. And it was great that we had the uh, video from Kids Hope. How many people here have actually ever really heard of Kids Hope before? Yeah, it's pretty good. And I'm kind of getting a sense of two thirds, sort of three quarters of the people. Um, to, to be a church and being able to engage in the life of a local school these days is very difficult. The doors to schools are, are normally shut for churches to participate. But at Kids Hope, we're actually invited in by our local school. And in fact, I know that they would like more volunteers. Uh, the people that uh, we work with in Kids Hope, the school identifies children who they seem who are at risk the ones who are, in a sense, on the, on the margin, the ones who are in need of help. And so it's actually the school who actually pinpoints children for us to connect with and sit with. I I've, I've actually find that quite an amazing thing, that they would do that. And so I just want to give a shout-out to all those who are doing it and those who are considering doing it. Uh, if you're in that space, that would be fantastic because one of the things that I find that's really critical about our faith journey is for each one of us to have a sense of how God has made us and what he's calling us to do in life because we are all different and the gifts that we have are different but the sense that we have when we are partnering in God's mission and he has, in a sense, made these things which connect with who we are as a person. I find that an incredible kind of like affirmation to personally my faith or whoever the person's talking about it. It's an incredible encouragement. And so wherever, if that's you, wherever you are engaged, knowing what you are called to do, I want to just give you a shout out and I want to say thank you. I want to encourage you to nurture that with all that you have to participate it in real ways. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the life of a, a church programs. We have people who, who work as chaplains in local footy clubs. Uh, Matt talked about Maroondah United and how people are partnering in there. For some of us, it might be we exercise the, the things that God has made us, the ways in which we're gifted in our local neighbourhood. And people who have a gift of hospitality and they invite people they run into in, a, in, their local, in their local network and they exercise it. That's fantastic. And I want to encourage you to, to do that, to find your place wherever that may be. And today we want to celebrate with each one of you. It's really important for each of us in our journey of faith to discover that. You know, on your way in today, you've uh, probably received a, a physical letter or if you're online... Our team is, um, they're going to post a link in the, uh, in the chat for you to click on and download it, because today we're actually beginning our Above and Beyond campaign. Uh, the purpose of this campaign is really is all about releasing funds so that we can further focus on our mission of transforming our community through the hope, meaning and love of Jesus. Uh, it's kind of natural, I suppose, to think that this campaign is about money, and to some degree it is. At CHBC, in the, in the past years, we, we haven't actually spoken often about money. And it's, it's probably a little bit unusual for a few reasons. Firstly, I think that finances, as you and I are very aware of, finances are an important part of life. And Jesus talked about money. And Jesus talked about money a lot. Also, uh, before I was a pastor, I actually worked in finance. I have a finance degree, and generally I'm comfortable to talk about and understand money, so I really shouldn't be afraid of talking about it. And finally, I want to say that personally, personally I've learned some of my most significant spiritual and faith lessons in life through money. Where my treasure is, what are my idols, greed what it is to sacrifice. I've learned things about this in significant ways personally through money. As much as we don't talk about it, in some ways it's a shame because it's a significant part of our lives and what it means to follow Jesus. And, I, and I'm praying for each one of us that through this time we would grow spiritually, that our faith would increase. Because primarily this, this campaign is about our vision and the faith that we need to participate in it together. The money is actually just kind of like a practical expression of that commitment. You know, I wish I could, um, 
I wish I could transport you back four or five days to Wednesday lunchtime. Uh, this past week on a Wednesday lunchtime, uh, the, the water was shut off at the ministry centre and so a number of the pastors and other kind of volunteer people and things like that gathered at my place. We had a little bit of a barbecue and, and we were sharing about some things that are going on uh, this year and in our lives and hearts. What's kind of this sense of, of where God is kind of placing things on our heart. And as we, as we shared about different things, there was this... There was this palpable sense of excitement and joy about what the year is all about, about some of the things that we believe that God is calling us to do. And and I wish I could transport you back there to be a part of it because it's talking about what our future is, because our this campaign is about the future. It's about seeing people's lives changed in real ways. It's about seeing people's lives changed in in things like Kids Hope or in the shed or in the shelter. It's about lives changed in our our football club or in our next-gen ministries in so many different places. That's what it's ultimately about. You see, usually when churches do finance campaigns, it's about raising money for buildings or maybe even a person. Well, this campaign is, is not about that. As a church, we have continued to seek to want to press into what we believe God is calling us in the future. Over the past few years, even, we've continued to do that in a variety of different ways. So a couple of years ago, it's this sense of needing to, to improve the way in which we do our connect groups. And so we wanted to press into that space. Most of you guys come regularly in the morning service. At our night service, we see significant numbers of young adults and we we have a sense of where God is moving in that space and so we've wanted to press into that space and release funds into there and invest in that area. And so that's what we've done. A couple of years ago, we took my my partner... My my partner, that sounds like he's my other wrong partner. Narelle's my wife. (laughs) Uh, Matt Moran is my work wife. Uh, (laughs) We've worked together now for nearly 10 years and we took him, in a sense, out of next gen. And most of you guys know Matt. He does a fantastic job in that space. But we had this sense of him being called into into ministry which reaches out into people who don't know Jesus at all. And we're excited that last year we ran an Alpha for the first time in many years. And even this year we're in the process of doing some pilot programs about forms of small churches that connect to people who have never been to a church, people who don't know Jesus at all. And as a church, for us, it's, it's critical that this is part of our vision to see lives change. And that's what this is about. We want to continue to invest in that space. We want to continue to press forward because... Now, I'll let you in on a little secret. I had a birthday this week and I turned 40... No, I turned 57. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, gifts can be sent to. No. <laughs> uh, you know what? I realise that at this stage of my life, that at some point in time, 10 years' time, who, whatever, I will probably retire from paid work. All right? Your mindset kind of changes, doesn't it? You're kind of planning for that sort of stage. Well, let me tell you, as a church, we're not planning for that. This church is not interested in retiring in the slightest. Okay? We are interested in the life of this church and this church community and beyond this community in 2024. But we're also interested in 2034 and 2054. Beyond, some of us will be gone. But we want to invest for the future because that's what this campaign is about. It is about building a church community that makes an impact here in the future. And so I'm inviting you, as I'm inviting myself and my wife, for us to participate in this, to come before God and to go, God, what would you lay on my heart? I've been praying about this personally for for a considerable amount of time, so I already personally have a sense of where I'm at. But what would God lay on each of our hearts? For us to come humbly before him, to seek him, and partner in this mission that we have together, to see our world transformed. It needs it more than ever before. And I'm inviting you to be a part of that. I'm going to briefly pray, and then we're going to continue with our kind of sermon series. That's a freebie you get for for joining this morning. God, um, 
God, we thank you that you are a God of love, that you are a God that changes lives. And Father, as we just share in this time, Father, we pray first of all that you would continue to change our lives, continue to grow our love for you, continue to grow our love for others. Father, we pray now that your spirit would speak to us. Amen. I regularly drive down Kalinda Road. I suspect that many of you drive down Kalinda Road. If you're not sure which road that is, it's the road which kind of heads straight down that away past Yarra Valley Grammar. And as I uh, drive down there, I'm inclined to check out what's happening at Kalinda Primary School. Uh, part of the reason, I suppose, is because my kids went to that uh, primary school. Uh, one of the things that I notice is that from time to time on their notice board, they broadcast what their school values are. Uh, Kalinda Primary School has some very simple school values. It says that we are respectful, we are resilient, and we are kind. Lovely values that the school has, but you didn't know this, but they actually have almost like a second set of values. It's almost like they weren't happy with their first set of values. These are a bit simple. We want to put something in there that's a little bit more, a little bit more energizing, a little bit more in the vernacular of the kids. And so here's a second set that they have. So it says that they encourage, in a sense, they challenge their students to meet the challenge. I'm not sure what the challenge is, but they want to meet the challenge. It said that they should treat others as they are treated. It says that they want them to be brave, to pursue their personal best, no matter who you work with. I like this one, to have reasons for things you say and do. That's a pretty profound thing for a kid who's in primary school, to have a reasons for things that they say and do. I remember as a 15-year-old boy, I'm not sure that I had reasons for most of the things that I said and do. <laughs> Another thing they have is to show great strength to be sensible. These are kind of like some little extra supplemental values that they have at the school. And I want to say that probably depending on your personality, depending on your experience, you might be excited by these values or you might actually roll your eyes about them. Now, over the past 30 years, the documenting of values has become pervasive. In the business world, some of the experts attribute it to the success of a book called Built to Last by an author called Jim Collins. But the truth is, is that statements of values are everywhere, aren't they, in the world today? You can find them in schools. You can go down to Eastland and you can find them in retail stores, in the sporting clubs, and you can see they'll have their values broadcast. Uh, in one leadership training uh, session I had a couple of years ago, we were asked to generate our own personal values statement. Here's kind of a little list of things on the screen here. How about you take 30 seconds and try and pick out two things. You don't have to tell anybody about them. Try and pick out two things for yourself of what you think is important. You can't pick out 20, just two. You've got 30 seconds. What's important? What's not important? The truth is that whether we like it or not, we all have values. Sometimes our values are accurately and articulately expressed. A lot of the time, my experience is that we have values that just exist below the surface of life. We only discover what they are when they are violated or opposed. And our mind says, wait a sec, that's not right. Our values, in fact, in life begin right at the beginning of life with the families that we are a part of. Because every family that I've ever encountered has their own set of values. The way that they do things, the priorities, the patterns of behaviour, the standards by which people are expected to live in their home. You would have had your own set of family values, whether you like it or not. You know, one of the fun things when I engage with couples doing, say, premarital counselling is we often do a, uh, an eye-opening exercise which is a, based around the idea of identifying your family of origin. How many people have ever heard that expression, family of origin? Ah, oh, some of the very intelligent people with us today. <laughs> family of origin simply is about is trying to understand the family that you come from 
what are the ways that you do things? What are the ways that you value things? How do you expect it to behave? And of course, when you take two people from different environments and you put them together, it's almost comic the way in which they do things differently. I'll give you a quick example. I come from a, a large Dutch family, right? Well, not really a Dutch family. My father's Tasmanian, which is kind of almost worse. But my mother's Dutch, and there wasn't a whole lot of money, right? And my mother operated on the value of efficiency, right? When you're feeding five children on not much, you've got to do things in an efficient way. So she lived in the world of bulk purchase, right? You don't go and buy lamb chops. You buy a lamb, you don't buy, you know, a couple of potatoes. Literally, my mum would buy like a 20 or 40 kilo bag of potatoes. And we would eat that in a week because, you know, like some of us are big eaters, right? <laughs> that was the way in which we did our family. Now, my wife, Narelle, she's a wonderful woman, but she comes from a family with two children, right? Two children. See, in our life, I wanted five kids. She wanted two, so we had two. No, no. She comes from a family with two children... <laughs> She comes from a family... Well, when you, my youngest daughter would say, when you've had perfection, you don't go any further. Uh, she comes from a family with two children, right? So the way in which her mother would shop was completely different than the way that my mother would shop. We can still remember the first time, because, you know, when you're young and in love, we went shopping together. I mean, <laughs> grocery shopping together. Is that not the definition of love? We went grocery shopping together, and we're going along... And I see, here's like butter or margarine, right? But here's the one that's on sale. So I put like three or four tubs of butter in the, in the trolley. Narell thought I was bananas, <laughs> right? Simply because her way of doing things in their family was completely different than my way of doing things in my family. What it was, was a clash of values because we all have values that are a part of us. We see them by what we prioritise in life. So how you use your time. So if you say that you value physical fitness, but you never exercise or don't play sport, well, that's actually not a value because your values are expressed in behaviour. Some people would say they have a value of generosity, but watch how they spend their money. Is that an expression of that value? Because behaviours express what the value is. As some people would say they have a, a value of education. So what time is allocated for study? I mean, how much family pressure, I mean, how much family encouragement is there for education? We see what those values are. They're revealed in how we spend our time, our money, our energy, what we prioritise. Because every... Every individual, every group has its own set of values. And it's actually a very helpful thing to be able to articulate and state them. The company that I joined out of university was called Hewlett Packard. It's a computer company. Some of you uh, may have some of their products. It was a company that was famous for its values. In fact, the founders of the companies expressed their, their values many years before it was popularised as a leadership technique. And I remember joining them as a, a graduate student in their grad program, and we were inducted into the life of the company. What happened was we were informed, told, demonstrated, drummed into us what these values were. These were things that we were expected to be a part of our behaviour as an employee. Not long after I joined, it was the company's 50th anniversary, and, and a few months after that, each one of us received a book. It was called The HP Way. It's a description of the values of the company written by the founders. We were told if we were going to be an employee of this company, this was how we were expected to behave. The problem, though, with values is this. The frustration becomes when they are just words on a wall that don't mean anything. 
55% of all Fortune 100 companies claim that integrity is a core value. Nearly 50% espouse customer satisfaction, 40% tout teamwork, and cookie cutter values never set a company apart. They kind of almost like fade into the crowd. They feel like a cliche. Sometimes they're even worse. Now take a look at this list of corporate values here on the screen. Communication, respect, integrity, excellence. Four punchy values. They sound pretty good, don't they? They're strong, they're concise, they're meaningful. These are the corporate values of Enron. They were painted on the office walls and proudly trumpeted in their annual report. En Enron was an oil trading company in Texas, 22,000 plus staff, $100 billion in revenue. But Enron now is a name that is synonymous with corporate fraud and corruption. The company hid massive trading losses. They deceived people. It was one of the largest financial scandals of the last 50 years and, and most significant bank bankruptcies. They hid literally billions of dollars worth of losses. And in fact, you can watch a documentary from 2005 called The Smartest Guys in the Room. Integrity, communication, respect, excellence, they're not meaningful, they're meaningless. In reality, their values were greed and corruption. You see, values are hollow if they actually never make a difference in the life of an organisation. Uh, one corporate consultant put it this way, he said, I've spent the last 10 years helping companies develop and refine their corporate values. What I've seen isn't pretty. Most value statements are bland, toothless, or just plain dishonest. Far from being harmless, as some executives assume, they're often highly destructive because empty value statements create cynical and dispirited employees, alienate customers, and they under, undermine their credibility. Strong values requires guts, constrains the behaviours of people, and they demand constant vigilance. Now, I'm, I'm a uh, keen follower of basketball. I quite love uh, basketball. I played for many years when I was younger. Basketball is a sport that is often dominated by a few gifted individuals. Because there's only five players on the court at one time, one player can impact the game much greater than, say, one AFL player who's on the field instead of 18 or a soccer player. One out of five can make a massive difference. And, and in my lifetime, uh, the sport has been dominated by single-name players. Magic, Bird, Jordan, Kobe, LeBron, Steph. Single-name players impact the game. They have an outsized impact. So I'm particularly intrigued by organisations that don't have, by teams that don't have one of these players, and how they try to remain competitive. How do they maximise the talent, so to speak, that they have? How do they do it? And one basketball team has become notorious, famous for doing this above all else. It's a team I hate but respect, the Miami Heat. They're a team that plays in the NBA and they seem to have a capacity to take players that other teams discard and improve them to a level that they could never have imagined. They draft players that others don't want and turn them into excellent players. They see the diamond in the rough and help them to become all that they can. And it all happens under what they call heat culture. They have it on the front of their jerseys. It's emblazoned on their court, heat culture. When they released a new jersey recently, they said this, the heat culture campaign reflects the standard that was established by their previous coach and president and it's carried out in their team's philosophy and nurtured by a consistent core. It's been their culture for nearly 30 years, they would say. It's the standard that's a part of who they are. It's core shared values. It's commitments and customs that inform how they do what they do as a basketball club. You can see there on the screen there, it has a, 
a free throw lane, right? It's not very easy to read on the right hand side. It says this, it says, we are the hardest working, best conditioned, most professional, unselfish, toughest, meanest, nastiest team in the NBA. The culture is deeply ingrained in the organisation. And they're not just words, not on a wall, but on the floor. It actually makes a difference. This culture is real, James Johnson, who was one of their players, says. We have the kind of practices where you can't go out and hang out all night, think you're going to be able to come to practice and really go hard, because, get this, I'll call you out. Everybody on this team will call you out. We won't leave it to the coaches to call you out. We take care of it ourselves. What he's saying is this is our culture and we own it. It makes a difference to who they are. You see, values can both make a difference or be hollow and empty. At their best, at their best, they are guiding principles that provide the organisation with some purpose and direction. They are the core ethics and beliefs that are a part of the community. What do you think Jesus valued in life? What do you think were kind of like the non-negotiables for Jesus? When I think of this, I go, what did Jesus do? How were those values expressed in his behaviour? I'm going to give you two which came to my mind. The first value is that I see in the life of Jesus is time with God the Father. In Mark 1, it says that before daybreak the next morning, what does it say? And Jesus got up and went to an isolated place to pray. And again and again and again, this behaviour express this value of time with God. It wasn't just words on a piece of paper. It made a difference. Another value that came to my mind was that Jesus had the value of welcome. I mean, would you describe Jesus as a person like this or as a person like this? Clearly, he was the one who had his arms wide open. In Luke 7, it says this, The Son of Man, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and you say he's a glutton, a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and other sinners. You know, some people would say that's a slur. For Jesus, it's a value. For Jesus, the one who who opens his arms wide for those who are on the margin of society the one who rubs shoulders with those, in a sense, who were lying in the dirt. This was a value that he expresses in life. So you see that connection between what was significant and how it impacted how they behaved? What are some of the values you think that Jesus tried to pass on to his people, to his followers? What sort of things might come to your mind? The first thing that hit me was this, the value of love. Now I'm giving you a new commandment, he says. Love one another. As I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples, my followers. This was a a non-negotiable value. It's meant to find its expression in some clear pattern of behaviour. Love one another. Another one that came to my mind was this value of intentional sentness. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. There's this sense that each person who is a follower of Jesus is called to the same mission of Jesus. That's a value that we are called to do. We have this intentionality of who we are created to be. This central part of our being and our calling as followers of Jesus is not just to sit and to be content, but to participate, to partner with the mission of Jesus. You see, the values of Jesus 
are impactful because they were modelled and lived out and made a difference. So what does that mean then for us? What are our values that are significant to us? What are they and how do we express them in simple, clear ways so that they become our patterns of behaviour, that they're kind of our accepted guidelines and standards for how we do things. And it doesn't matter whether it's how we do things when we gather together in this room, how we gather together in a a soccer club or in a kids or in a shed. These are patterns of behaviour that uh, permeate all of life. They are the things that we value, they're standards for how we live. Well, Well, over the next weeks, A number of us are going to share about the values that are central to the life of this church, the ways in which we have tried to express what it means to be a part of this church community. Here are those values, that we would be a place where we are centred on God. It's not really rocket science, is it? We are centred on God. It means that we lift up God, that we exalt God, but we also means that we humble ourselves. We want to be a place where we love like Jesus. We love like Jesus. Think about the way in which Jesus loved. He's gracious, compassionate. It's what we want to mark our love our love for each other, our love for others who don't know Jesus, that we would love that way. We want to be a place like Jesus where everyone is welcome, where people have a sense that they are able to belong and participate and have some sense of meaning, that they are a part of a community. But we're not just about a community that just looks into itself because we want to be a place that looks beyond ourselves. We want to see the kids who sit on the margin at local schools. We want to be a church that sees the refugee, that sees the homeless man. We want to look beyond ourselves. And finally, we want to be a church that makes a difference in what we do. Because it's not just a matter of seeing, it's a matter of seeing God's love transform their lives. You may have heard me on occasion share one of my values. I want us to be known for what we stand for, not what we stand against. Standing for something is about seeing something make a difference in a positive way. For God has called us to be part of this action of renewing the world. Can can you see the flow in those values? Our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, our relationship transforming the world. See, our values are critical because it is more important, understand this, it's more important who we are than what we do. It's more important who we are than what we do. And our values are an expression of who we are. You see, there's nothing, there's nothing that damages the church of Jesus Christ more than hypocrisy, more than not living out those values. The Christian church of 2024 is paying a price for the behaviours of the church of the past 50 years. The church in Western society claimed values of moral uprightness, compassion, and yet they harboured pedophiles and permitted power-hungry leaders. And we pay a price for that today because the values were hollow and meaningless. I say to each one of us, as I say to myself, let's not leave that journey. Let's live out those values collectively, the values of Jesus to make a difference in our world. You see, values make a difference when they're owned by each one of us. You know, there are uh, literally hundreds of people who volunteer in this church community. And I want to say to you today, if you are a volunteer, it is so important that you live by our values 
Each one of us represents them. Each one of us, not just pastors who stand up the front or something like that. Each one of us lives up those, lives out those values. Let's take them on board and find expression in them. Let's model them. Let's be a part of seeing our world changed through those love. In our staff team, we've um, spent considerable time talking about what is important for us to be as a staff team. We have our own set of values that we've developed probably five years ago. They're values that we uh, review probably twice a year collectively. They're things that we talk about. We use the, the language for us. They are significant because they... Um, they are in the, our minds and heads and impact us in our hearts. So two of the values that we have, for example, are this. One of the values we have is called embrace the mess. And it's a value which says that people's lives are messy. We don't want to walk away from that. We want to embrace it. We, we want to, in a sense, if I can say this, get down and dirty with people in their hurt and their pain. And... When we have um, uh, some pastors meetings from time to time and we're talking about difficult situations, embrace the mess rears its head up because it reminds us to run to it, not run away from it. Uh, another value that we have in our team is called never settle. We have this sense that God is calling us always to push forward. We always want to be thinking about what the future is. The values make a difference in how we do things. And I would love to believe that for us as a church community, our values would make a difference in who we are. But they would be things that are, in a sense, the standard of being part of this community. That if we were to walk down to Eastland and talk to a couple of people and they said, do you know that church that's up there? What are they like? And they said, they're a church, and they wouldn't use our language, but they're a church who is involved. They're a church who is helping those who are on the margin. They're a church who wants to see justice happen. They're a church who actually is a place of love. Then we would know that our values have made a difference because that's what we would be known by. Let's pray together, shall we? For our God, we thank you that... We thank you that you call us to be part of your family. Your family of love and grace and mercy. A family where we are called your son, your daughter a family where we are given gifts and, and talents to, to exercise and serve with, a family where you, you create opportunities and, and plans for people to live out that transformed life. And our God, we pray that, that as a community that we would live out that calling and what it is to be part of your family. Our God, may we be known, may we be known by these values that represent you. Father, give us the courage. Give us the, the sense of calling. Give us the love through your spirit to live these out each day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.